Hello, Wire Wizard here. Now, as the title of this video suggests, I am going to talk about bad games. Yes, bad games. I have seen many videos on YouTube about <laughs> bad games, especially from user James Nintendo Nerd who hosts a video series called The Angry Video Game Nerd. <laughs> now, at first I thought this guy had a terrible anger management problem. But I come later to realize that it was all just an act on his part. <clears throat> but I do remember him <laughs> giving one game very positive reviews. This game, Ninja Baseball Batman, hmm, confusing title. It's not a baseball game, and it's not a superhero game. You know, huh, all that it is, it's just a, a fighting game, <laughs> similar to uh, Double Dragon, where you play uh, <laughs> a baseball player, well, not exactly a baseball player, but a baseball man, or two baseball men, if it is two-player, beating up baseballs, cameras, planes, stuff like that. <clears throat> he gave some very positive reviews of that game. And I left a message on his, uh, <laughs> on the comments for that video, asking him to <laughs> give some other games more positive reviews. Okay. But enough about that. Throughout my 35 years of playing video games, I had come across a lot of really bad games. Now, what made these games so bad? Well, Many things. Poor graphics, poor sound or no sound, poor arcade to console translations, even poor arcade games themselves. <clears throat> now, what would I say was the worst video game I have ever played? Well, I don't know. A lot of games take that honor. Hmm. Well, first off, Atari's translation of Pac-Man. Just freaking awful. Oh, God. I mean, I don't know what the hell Atari was thinking, you know, rushing their designers to get it done for the Christmas season back then, 1980 or 81. But this game looked absolutely nothing like the arcade uh, Pac-Man. <clears throat> now, I also remember that the Odyssey 2 had a Pac-Man clone called Casey Munchkin, which was Oh, excuse me, much better than Atari's really, really shitty translation of Pac-Man. Now, what exactly was wrong with uh, Pac-Man? Well, I will tell you. <clears throat> Excuse me. But anyway, the first thing wrong with Pac-Man was the main character himself. He didn't look anything like the main character in the Pac-Man arcade game. I mean, for one, the way his mouth opened and closed and the fact that they put an eye on him. Oh, and the fact that he didn't rotate up and down as he went up and down. He was always facing left or right. 
even as he was going down. But another thing, the ghosts themselves, they were all the same color and sometimes were hard to see even when they were separated. I mean, and another problem was that when you ate the, when Pac-Man ate the power pellets, you often heard a weird sound and the uh, ghost would change color only very slightly. And when Pac-Man ate the ghosts, their eyes slowly floated back to the center. And even with the <laughs> difficulty at its highest, it didn't move very fast and they didn't roll in the direction that they were moving. Primitive. Very. And another thing that was wrong with it, the color schemes were all wrong. I mean, the maze itself was blue, sky blue and yellow rather than black and blue like the arcades. And the dots? There weren't dots at all. There were dashes. And the center prize? I would call that nothing more than a vitamin. No fruits, nothing. Now, they did make improvements in the Pac-Man sequel called Miss Pac-Man. I mean, they made the detail almost perfect, putting the bow on Miss Pac-Man. I don't remember exactly, but I think she did have an eye. And she did rotate the way she moved, not like her boyfriend Pac-Man did. Now, but still, the color schemes were still off. A blue background with, uh, I don't remember, yellow or green walls. But they did get the uh, fruits in. Of course, not in the center. They would hop in from one exit to the maze, maze hop around all over the maze until either Miss Pac-Man caught them or they hopped out the other end. Now another thing, the ghosts, their eyes still didn't roll in the direction they moved. They just shifted left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right. But the uh, difficulty was modified on that to include one, two, three, or all four ghosts. But one weakness still, the da dots were still dashes. But <laughs> the Atari 2600, that was a very bad console. It had very, very few games that I liked. I mean, <clears throat> I can remember my most favorite game that I liked on the Atari 2600, uh, a 3D game called Moonsweeper. I mean, the company that made that, iMagic, they made some really high quality games. And of course, I know Atari had a lot of third party developers, most of which didn't get into agreements or contracts with Atari. They were completely independent. And I know one of these third party developers was actually sprung from Atari itself. You probably know what I'm talking about. Activision, the company that's still around today making video games and software for computers and various consoles. But, <laughs> 
still, I liked uh, Activision for, uh, for the games they had uh, done. I mean, what was for my most favorite Atari 2600 game by Activision? Well, it was River Raid. I mean, that game, it didn't, didn't repeat. It was good. Very good. I mean, I remember the uh, designer of that game was a, a woman. I couldn't remember her name. But I have played River Raid for hours and hours and hours, seeing if I could get any part of the game to repeat itself, which it didn't. And the difficulty was all the same throughout those hours. Now, another Atari 2600 Activision game I loved was called Mega Mania. Now, that game was a Space Invaders clone. But what made it different was the spaceship had an energy bar at the bottom that ran out as time went by. And if you didn't destroy the uh, wave of invaders and that energy bar ran out, you lost a ship. But uh, another thing that made Mega Mania interesting were the invaders were common household items like hamburgers, bow ties, dice, steam irons. <laughs> it was weird. But an enjoyable game. My lo mother loved that game when she had it. But of course, years later I got a much, much better console. The ColecoVision. Now the ColecoVision was far, far superior to the Atari 2600. I mean, true, it was an 8-bit console, but it had many advantages over the uh, Atari 2600, like better graphics, better sounds, more game memory, and all that. I had tried the first version, the, the Atari 2600 of Donkey Kong. That game was so laughable. I mean, <laughs> that game had only two screens. Ridiculous. I mean, Donkey Kong himself in that game didn't even throw the barrels. The barrels just rolled themselves all the way to Mario. But what did Donkey Kong do? All he did was stand on the platform with Pauline, and every time Mario climbed a ladder, or turned around, he would stamp his feet and beat his chest. <laughs> you know, I can remember a few times when I did this on the joystick to see how fast I could get <laughs> Donkey Kong to stamp his feet and beat his chest. Oh, but enough of that. Now, ColecoVision's version was much better. Donkey Kong wasn't on the platform with Pauline. He was actually standing there in a three frame animation, gathering the barrels, and then turning around, and then rolling them down the ramp. Now, perhaps the one drawback to the ColecoVision version is that whenever Mario finished a stage, it didn't show the animation of Donkey Kong climbing the ladder and taking Pauline with him, moving on to the next stage. And they got the stages all out of order. They had put stage four in second place and stage, stage uh, two in third place. But, of course, when you completed Stage 4, it didn't show the animation of Donkey Kong beating his chest and the platforms falling out of, all out under him, and then he falling head first into him and his eyes spinning like crazy. 
But still, the ColecoVision version of Donkey Kong was pretty good. But of course, I didn't play very many other games that Coleco made for Atari. I had played a lot of ColecoVision uh, games, third-party games, and stuff, and I tell you, the ColecoVision was a pretty good console. But then came the infamous video game crash of the early to mid-80s. Back then, I had sunk into a, a depression because there would be nothing new to play, nothing new for ColecoVision or Intellivision. I mean, <laughs> I had the Intellivision first. My mom bought that first, but then made the uh, mistake of switching to the crappy Atari 2600 because of the way the controllers were on the Intellivision. No, but anyway, the video game crash lasted for 18 months to a year. And then came the Nintendo Entertainment System. I remember that system like it was yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I got that system when I was 16 years old, and I had gotten with it Super Mario World Duck Hunt Combo Cartridge, as well as hmm, Ghosts and Goblins, Rad Racer, RC Pro-Am, uh, Russian Attack, Jackal, Life Force, Gradius. So many games, I can't recall them all up to here. It was too bad I didn't keep them all. <laughs> but anyways, I had gone through uh, two NESs, you see. What happened was to the first one was the asshole that was pretending to my, be my father. I won't get into that now, but... He had taken my NES and sold it for drug money. Hmm. I forgive him, but <laughs> I'll never talk to or see him again. Because I know that he is dying of hepatitis C. Proper payback for a life on drugs. Yeah, but... Moving on, my second NES, I had gotten a lot more games for it. Well, the number was 20 or 30. Oh, excuse me. Oh, all right. Now, anyway, <clears throat> it was then that I started seeing advertisements for the Sega Genesis. I was intrigued to say the least. Oh, excuse me. Anyway, the commercials bragged about how the Sega Genesis was 16 bit and the Nintendo Entertainment System was only 8 bit. And I thought, ooh, that was interesting. But huh, Sega, Sega was very negative about that. I didn't really like negative advertising where the uh, makers of the commercial, the advertising, highlight only the positive points of the product while highlighting the negative points of their competitors' products. That was some poor advertising. Genesis does what Nintendo don't. <laughs> How pathetic. But anyways, I did get a Gen Sega Genesis with Sonic 2. Did I enjoy it? Yeah, I did enjoy it. I played many games on it. Many of them. 
I had played huh, Sonic 2, Sonic 3, Sonic and Knuckles. I'd also played uh, Steel Empire. That's my most favorite Genesis game. And quite a few others. But then Nintendo comes back with the NES. Now that was one really kick-ass console. So, <laughs> I had eventually gotten a Super NES, I'd say eight months after I'd gotten my Sega Genesis. I mean, I had gotten with it Super Mario World, Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, Super R-Type, Radius 3, many, many others. I had nearly 50 games on my Super NES had it for five years. But of course, Sega, in their sneaky ways, decided to change their advertising strategies. They didn't switch from negative advertising to positive advertising. Nope. Nope, Arino. They started this whole bullshit of blast processing saying the Sega Genesis was faster than Super NES. You know, I had decided to check that out. Oh, really? So, I had decided to uh, buy... I decided to compare two of their fastest games. Number one was uh, Sonic 3. And on the Super NES, I had tried the Roadrunner game. Now, I couldn't see very much difference between the two. I mean, they appeared to be just as fast. But the sound on the Super NES was far better than the sound on the Sega Genesis. Plus, the Super NES had way more colors than the Sega Genesis. Now, anyway, <clears throat> eventually Sega had decided to trump up their market with uh, add-ons, like the Sega CD, which I had gotten, and the Sega 32 which, 32X, which I have tried. Didn't find it to be very good, because the way it had to be put on the Sega Genesis, but... For, for, the, uh, for the Sega CD, I had gotten a few games, including Sonic CD, which was very good. Sewer Shock, which came with it. And uh, quite a few others. Oh, and another favorite Sega Genesis game of mine was Eternal Champion. That game had such kick-ass music. But not that the music of the games on the Super NES were bad. They had quite a few good games. Good <laughs> games with good music, excuse me. Alright. But, going back to uh, all of the bad NES, Sega Genesis, and Super Nintendo games, what made most of these games so bad was their gameplay. I mean, some of them were ridiculously hard. But the way I see it, you know, there is a fine line between challenge and making a game so difficult it becomes unenjoyable. But if you want to know what my favorite uh, game on the Sega, uh, no, not the Sega Genesis, but the Super Nintendo was, Chrono Trigger. That was the biggest game the Super NES had. Following a close behind Final Fantasy VI, which was at the time called Final Fantasy III. And behind that, Secret of Mana. Good game. Now, 
on the Sega CD, my favorite game there was Sonic CD. I mean, that game had some really good music. A vast improvement over the Sega Genesis, where voices were often garbly. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I had uh, met in some games I wasn't very skilled, but I got better and better at them. Some games I never played again after renting them. But huh, I remember one particularly bad game on the Super NES. You probably know what I'm talking about. Less for the unlikely. Bad game. Pathetic. I mean, that game probably had the worst main character of all. <laughs> I mean, this nerdy asshole ran from a ran from tortoises when they came out of their shells. Ridiculous. Okay. But now, moving on to the later generations of consoles. One time I rented a PS1 from uh, Blockbuster Video. I had decided to try it. And the game that I tried with it was called Kiliak. The DNA Imperative. That was a very interesting first-person shooter game. Where you ran around as a, a mech inside of a, a base in Antarctica. Shooting down monsters, ro out-of-control robots, and super tough bosses. I mean, I enjoyed it. So, about... A few months later, I bought my own PS1, along with the game Gex. <laughs> yeah, if you ever played that game, you know it was funny. Gex, a wise-cracking couch potato gecko. You know, I can remember the uh, introduction to that game. It was very good. How the main character to that game was uh, explaining his story. Being the gecko he is, but the gameplay of Gex itself was very interesting. You could do things in Gex that you couldn't do in other games, like cling to walls and ceilings. I didn't know any Super NES or Sega Genesis game where you could do that. But I had bought quite a few games for my PS1. I still have most of them, but a few of them got damaged, and three of them I donated to Classic Game Room. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. But anyway, <clears throat> the PS1 had its share of uh, bad games, and it also had some very good arcade translation. Like the submarine side-scrolling shooter game, In the Hunt. That one was very well done. But also R-Types, which is a collection of R-Type and R-Type 2. That game was duplicated from the arcade pixel by pixel. Incredible. Something you would never find on the Atari 2600, ColecoVision, NES, Genesis, or Nintendo. Super Nintendo, excuse me. Now, I had the PS1 for about mm, seven years until the PS2 was released. So I had saved up money and bought a PS2 and sold my PS1 to a pawn shop. Now, what was the uh, game with the PS2 that I had gotten? I don't remember the title, but it was a a quad racing game where you could do freestyle stunts on quad bikes off-road. <laughs> it was cool. But I also had gotten Real Pool. That was a very good game. A lot better than the previous pool games that I had tried. 
Oh, wow, I'm getting tired here. Anyways, back to the PS2. I had played many Final Fantasy games on the PS1, four of which I have mentioned in my last video, and a couple on the PS2, Final Fantasy 10 and 12. Why no Final Fantasy 11? Well, that game was strictly an MMORPG, and I wasn't interested in it. Oh, but, huh. I had gotten... I had rented many games for the PS2 and the PS1. I have shown you some of the games I have for my PS2 now. I also had a, an Xbox for a couple of years. I had a few games on that. The controller was all weird. Very different. But I played my share of games on that and sold it after it was discontinued. Uh, but, oh, excuse me. But now here it is, June 15th of 2013, and I have my PS3 now. I had gotten it a few months ago after uh, I had received a bonus, received a, a great bonus from my work on Ornum. Thank you very much, Ornum. I had gotten this, and I got the monitor I use now with that bonus. But, huh. anyways, I didn't get any games with my PS3, but I did get one before that, Gran Turismo 5XL. So, I had a, a game that I could play with my PS3 that was a PS3 game. But, of course, I tried playing PS2 games, but, huh, wouldn't play I question why Sega wouldn't make the PS3 backwards compatible with the PS2, although backwards compatible with PS1. I sure hope they don't make that mistake with the PS4. Because I will get that maybe a few months after it's released. I don't know. Uh, yeah. But anyway... Have I played any bad games on the PS3 yet? I would say no. PS2? Well, I would say yes, but they would be bad because of their gameplay quality rather than graphics or sound quality. I won't give any titles. But then again, that is all I will say. Now, I have to tell you uh, that I am considering starting a review channel for video game reviews that I will give. And I'm going to call it Video Game Retrospective Reviews. I will review games that I have and give you my opinions on them. And I will try to include screenshots and video. Now, if you would uh, like me to review other games, games that I have, just leave comments. But if you'd like to like me to review uh, a game that I don't have, I'll try and buy it. But if you're willing to donate, I'll accept. But leave your comments here. I will read them. And I'll try to get back to you if I can. I am Wire Wizard, and I thank you for viewing this video.